successfully obtained from the, the uh, National Archives copies of all the movies that were taken at the Nuremberg trial. Oh, is that right? That's good. And I see the name of John DeLongre all the time. Yeah, well, I, I was the cinematographer there. How did you get involved in that kind of job? Well, I was in the U.S. Army, and that's, well, they assigned me to that location, to that post. Did you? That's the way it went. It was very, very nice, very enjoyable. I worked in a castle in the, in a, in the Palace of Justice, and I, at that night, my billets were at the, uh, at the, uh, let's see, a big, a big castle. Oh, uh, uh, Farber. Yeah, Farber. Yeah, Farber ca Castle, exactly, yeah. So it was a very good assignment. Now, were you there the entire trial? Not the entire trial. I was there for, I would say, the, um, yeah, I was there for most of it. Yeah, I would say I, I probably missed a, a couple of weeks at the beginning. Right. And I was there for the rest of it, and then that was it. It was a very good assignment. I noticed that they didn't film the entire trial. How did you know what portions of the trial to film? Well, we we filmed most of it because we were giving copies of all their uh, the, the photography to the, the different newsreels at the time. Okay. Because they were not allowing the the newsreels to come in. Okay. It would have been bedlam to have all the newsreel camera in there. You see, so uh, the U.S. Army Signal Corps took all the footage, and we made, we made copies. And we used to go to we used to go to Munich. There's a big photograph, German photographic studio there, mm -hmm. movie studio. Right. And they did all the processing of the film for us, and made the copies, and then we shipped the copies to the different uh, accredited uh, newsreel companies. Okay. That's the way it worked. Now, how long were your reels? Uh, when you put a reel in to take the film, was it about 10 minutes? No, it's a little bit longer than that. It's probably... It's probably 30 minutes. Okay. Yeah, so it was difficult to judge. Yeah, there was a lot, lot, lot of wasted time, of course. We tried to photograph the thing that was uh, of interest, you know. So we listened to the to the transcript. There was a, a system of translations, uh, multi-language. And so you could tune in whatever language you wanted, either Russian or French or, or German or English. Right. You, you, I guess you knew that, huh? Right. So we listened to the translation and figured out what was going on. And then we did that to, to run the cameras or not run the cameras. Now, how many members were on the camera crew itself? We had about, we, I think we had about two or three, there were three sound booths. There were soundproof uh, enclosures where we did not, where the cameras were running and they were, of course, noisy and they did not disturb the court. Mm-hmm. And we were shooting behind a glass enclosure, uh, and it was uh, it was quite silent too. So we had about three crews shooting from different locations. Right. And I remember one day I took a, a camera into the courtroom myself and I went to, to get some better shots, and I promptly got a note from the judge saying, "How long is that record going to go on?" <laughs> <laughs> I stopped. <laughs> so you you really were not able to get very close. No, we could not get anywhere close. No. Yeah. Uh, we were restricted to soundproof booth. And I find interesting is you had to anticipate the important parts of the trial. Exactly. But otherwise, you wasted a lot of film, and it took time. You didn't want to be caught with, while the, the camera was empty of film, and you were in the middle of recharging the camera. Right. So you want to make sure you have plenty of film ready for things of importance. You know. So it was a, a matter of judgment. You know. Did you know in advance what was tried to well, what was trying to be accomplished that day? Yeah, Did we had some some inkling, but it was not very precise. You know, it was not very accurate. We we did the best we could, and I think we came out with a lot of lot of interesting footage. Well, you see a lot of that on the documentaries. Oh yes, uh, and I'm sure that's your footage. Now, all the newsreel received copies of that, and then they they probably still own them. You know, right. It was, a, it was an interesting assignment, I tell you. I really enjoyed it. Did you have a chance to uh, really meet at all any of the prosecutors uh, and, and have any chance to interplay with any of those people? 
No, occasionally, yeah. But we did also uh, had to eat, uh, meet, I uh, had a chance to meet some of the uh, defendants, too. Ah, like who? The uh, Goering. Oh. The Goering, my brother, my brother and I were in the, in the same service, in the same team, and we got to speak to Goering, took his uh, portrait, and uh, Ribbentrop and von Papen, these yeah. are the people I remember. Were you able to film them? No, we, we were not filming them. We were taking still pictures of them. Ah. It was different. Yep. Was there a, uh, a prohibition about filming the, in the prison? No, we never went to the prison. We were, we were only in the courthouse. Oh, okay. Only in court. The prison was nearby, but we were never allowed in there. How interesting. It was quite, quite, uh, quite interesting, yes. Did you ever have a chance to meet uh, Justice Jackson? No, I never met Justice Jackson, no. Uh, and, or any of the prosecutors, like Thomas Dodd, or... I've never met any of them, but I got I got his book, you know, the book by his, uh, his uh, son, I guess. Yes. The, the Letters of Nuremberg? Yeah, that's, yes, Christ Senator Christopher Dodd. This just came out, I'm in the process of reading it now. Very interesting book for me. <laughs> Did you get an impression as you're filming this uh, about the trial itself? Uh, you know, did you think you were in a part of history? I think it was something that had never been done before. I had the feeling this was something pretty big, you know, it had never been done before that I remembered. Was that, you know, I was a young man there that didn't have much of a background in, in law or in, in criminal uh, cases, you know. To me, this was all brand new. Did you, uh, uh, as it was filming along, did you were able to get any sense of any of the defendants, like Gehring or Hess, uh, as the kind of people they were? And Hess was definitely different. Hess was definitely not not present. He, he, he had a strange behavior. Mm -hmm. And uh, from, uh, from Bob was a pretty, pretty nice guy. And uh, as a matter of fact, I think uh, from Bob and, let's see, I forget which one, there was one of the defendants that was set free. Yeah, that was Von Poppen. It was Von Poppen. As a matter of fact, he was set free, and he was probably picked up by the German authorities, and he was sent for trial in what they call a denazification trial. Right. And that was a German court. And I, I went to the German court with my camera crew, and we took movies of that, too. No kidding. I... You know, I, now that you mention it, I think that's part of the collection we have. Yeah, the Fort Poppin denazification trial. I was there, and I, I took uh, quite a bit of footage there. It was in a German courthouse. I spoke just enough Germans to get along, so I was able to get in there and uh, film the whole thing. Wow. Uh, do you keep uh, in contact with it? Uh, is there any other cameramen or photographers that you keep in contact with? No, unfortunately, there was one contact I had, a gentleman that lived in the New York area. I can't, he's got an Italian name, and I oh. can't think of his name right now. In fact, I was introduced to him through two of your good officers. Somebody called me there and said, do you know this man? I said, no, and then they gave me his phone number. I was able to talk to him on the phone. This was many, many years ago. Yeah, his name is Ray Diadario. Yeah, that's the one, that's the one. And recently, I met a real estate lady that, that works around here, and that's her, that's the daughter. I'll be darned. Yeah, so I talked to her about her father. Her father was getting old, of course, and uh, she was uh, not in daily contact with him, but it was interesting to see if somebody with the same name. Dear, dear, that's the one, that's the one. But also, did you work with any of the radio guys at all? Did no, we, we just had the photographic crew. We, we, we had still photography and then motion picture photography. And we had a, a, a laboratory where we developed all our own still photos. And then the, 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 the motion picture footage was sent to Munich, to the Munich studio mm -hmm. for developing. But that, that was the only contact. We didn't have any contact with the radio people. No. Did you stay after the main trial was done? Yes, well, I was uh, until the main trial, that's right. And there were a few other trials going on. There was a, the, the Nazi doctors was also, were also tried. And did you stay for that or did you leave after that? Uh, I stayed for that 
and I saw a, call, a German general called General Milch. Yes. Yeah, and he was also tried. I went to his trial also. Do you have a chance that I'll reflect on your one year of, or one or two years at Nuremberg, uh, kind of what that means to you? Oh, yeah, I think about it quite often. I think about it, especially my wife just gave me for my birthday. She gave me this book, uh, The Letters from Nuremberg, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm in the process of reading. It's quite, quite, quite amazing, quite amazing story. Were you able to keep anything from the trial itself? Any your own private movies or pictures? Oh no, no, you could not take movies because they were thirty-five millimeter, and it's not a practical size for an individual. What do you think the legacy of the of the Nuremberg trials was, from your perspective, as a through through your lens? Well, I, I think I think in the future, anybody that wants to start a war will think about being put on on. on trial at the end of the conflict. In fact, you can see now all kinds of war crime trials going on in different parts of Europe uh, for recent conflict, you know? And I think that's very important. It, it was, did not exist before this. After World War I, there was no such uh, trial. And as a result, this what created World War II because the Germans were dissatisfied with the, uh, the treatment they got at the uh, at the Versailles uh, Treaty, you know. Mm -hmm. So this is what started the rise of, of Hitler, and this is what caused World War II. So hopefully this 